All right. Hello. We're here today with Brennan Dunn of W Freelancing and Right Message. How's it going, Brennan? I'm good, Garrett. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, can you give us a little bit of history, uh, help us understand the arc and your trajectory that got you to where you are today with Right Message? Yeah, so quick backstory. Um, did the started my first, I guess, uh, startup y thing out of college back early 2000s. Um, we did lead generation for mortgage workers and stuff. That was interesting. Taught me a lot about business, taught me a lot about kind of the basics of, you know, doing something like this. Our whole model back then was uh, doing AdWords to generate leads, doing high touch sales, and then generating leads for our clients and making money that way. Uh, mortgage bubble burst, we were out of that business pretty quickly. That led me eventually to consulting. Um, started out freelancing, grew to an agency, got it to 11 people, and wanted to, I saw people like, um, you know, you, Amy, others who had software businesses and really wanted to get out of having uh, a really high amount of fixed overhead with, uh, you know, three active clients at any given time paying the bills. So I wanted to kind of flip the equation, have a lot of people paying a little bit of money. So a big pain point for me, and I was going through Amy's, uh, Amy Hoy's uh, course at the time, running this agency, was struggling with our own project management concerns. So did what, you know, I think a lot of us do, which is scratch your own itch. And um, I started a company called PlanScope, which was, or is, I should say, a project management tool, uh, but it's targeting freelancers. So it's very budget focused and very focused on kind of the, a lot of the kind of gotchas that uh, freelancers have when working with clients. So did that, did the whole like, realized it's hard to sell SaaS, didn't have an audience of any sort at the time. So I, um, I started writing about what I learned building this agency. So I wrote about things that were kind of tangential to project management or freelance project management. Like how do you get clients? How do you pitch them? How do you write proposals? You know, and so on. Um, that did well. The goal was people would find that content and then sign up for PlanScope. Didn't really happen as much as I wanted that to happen. But what really ended up happening was, you know, I, I started to create and, and I was I was very concerned doing this because my background is I'm an engineer. I did not like the idea of writing like ebooks and stuff. Um, but I, I realized that people were really getting a lot of value out of my free content. And there's a lot more I could say. So I ended up uh, really because PlanScope wasn't growing like I needed it to. I started creating uh, ebooks and then courses and so on, and this started to do extremely well to the point where PlanScope was kind of becoming a thorn in my side in that I was still running the SaaS and uh, people were depending on it, but I was basically full time doing this uh, course info stuff for freelancers. So got to the point where I, um, like you, I reached out to FE International to uh, sell the company or really sell the product. I didn't sell the company. I just did an asset trans transfer the product. Um, that got me out of PlanScope, made a, you know, a small amount of money on it, nothing, nothing huge. Um, but this let me focus all my energy on running W Freelancing. So W Freelancing, which is what the content arm, the content marketing arm of PlanScope became, uh, became my full time was really focused on that. And through doing that, I ended up realizing there's a lot of different types of freelancers, different stages of business. Some want to be agencies, some haven't even started yet. So I started dabbling in website personalization, which for me was fair enough. I mean, if you're building a SaaS, if you go to your dashboard, you see your data, not other people's data. And it's really just a bunch of if conditions usually that say like, if they have this, then show this. Uh, so I thought, why not do the same, but on WordPress? Um, so that got me kind of down this rabbit hole of website personalization. It did really well. And it got me on the radar of a few companies who were considerably bigger who said, can you do this for us? I did that for them. I released a course on automation and personalization. It did really well. I included the, the source code uh, that I used on W Freelancing or the basics of it and said, have at it. And, uh, people complain saying, I want this, but I'm a marketer. What the heck is this JavaScript stuff? Um, and that led me about, what, a year ago or so to break ground on a product called Right Message and um, partnered up with a guy named Shai, who's my co-founder, 
And uh, yeah, I've been kind of running that while also keeping an eye on W Freelancing ever since. So there's so many layers to that that I absolutely love. One is <laughs> that it's so easy for everybody to see, oh, he launched a great app and it's doing well and I want to do that. But none of what you've done to get here has been, um, it's not like you set up, I mean, how, so when did you launch PlanScope? How, it was about the same time as Sifter, right? 2011. So, it was 2011. Okay, okay so launched. about seven yeah. years ago. Yep. Um, you launch that, you learn about SaaS, you get familiar with it, you're writing content, which ends up turning into the bigger business and start getting into info products, which then through your own, scratching your own itch, you're learning, oh, well, there's ways I could sell this to other people. And then you see the opportunity because mm -hmm. you had, and you famously, I love that you used to call it the Plinko board uh, yeah. for double your freelancing. And you got into some productized consulting there yeah. and then some screencasts and, you know, more products that are explaining things to people. And then finally having enough context, both from the SaaS side and from the uh, Plinko board side, if you will, to say, there's something here, right message could be a product. Although I guess it wasn't right message at that point, but this could be a, a SaaS product that I can have get go, get back to recurring revenue and do that with people. Um, just the secure circuitousness of it, I think, is awesome because most people just we all want to dive into a SaaS app and just get it started uh, without realizing there's so much to learn and so much background to handle ahead of time, um, so that it we have enough insight and understanding to do it well. Uh, so I I love that part. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole thing is just a series of and thens, right? <laughs> but it, I, I like to think that even though Right Message, we launched publicly January 23rd of this year. But if you go back to WordPress conversion funnel .com, this is 2012 for me, WordPress plugin worked with Infusionsoft to let you do that Plinko board kind of model. Um, this, it's been a long time coming, which I think has made it so the success of it and really our attitude and building and running it is much different than uh, when I was just doing my little project management SaaS, never really done this stuff before. Um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, it's easier to start with an audience and I agree with that, but I think it's also easier to start with potentially other mediums of validation versus just saying, I'm going to go head first into software um, and, you know, starting it by you know, People buy right message for the same reason that they bought my consulting. They wanted, uh, they thought that personalization would increase sales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's they're buying the same outcome. Um, how they get to that outcome is different and a, a different model, but it's much easier to sell a productized consulting thing where you're saying, here's where I can get you, here's what I'll do. You do the legwork yourself and then, you know, complete that transaction. Versus saying, I'm going to go and build a SaaS from scratch and try to achieve that same thing. And I know SaaS is much sexier. I know the recurring revenue stuff is much cooler than uh, consulting. But I think we would be in a much different position these days with the right message if we didn't start that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, having a rough idea is completely different than the things you're going to learn once you're getting your hands dirty, implementing it for somebody else. The questions they're going to ask you, the things they're going to challenge and push back on. Um, the things they're going to ask for all help steer you in the right direction to give you the insight to successfully launch something uh, yep. in a different form. Uh, so I want to talk about PlanScope for a second. And so you sold it. You sold it through FE. So you inevitably mm -hmm. went through um, some level of due diligence. In hindsight, um, what did you learn that you did wrong, that you would do differently, or that you did explicitly do differently this time around based on that experience? Yeah, so the big mistake I made was as I, so PlanScope was under the umbrella that was my consulting business. So I didn't want to have, you know, five different corporations. I wanted a single company that would basically be kind of an umbrella company, um, which meant that, you know, when selling uh, PlanScope, it was an asset transfer. It wasn't a company sale, first off, meaning I sold the code base and I sold the customers. Um so that was one thing. But the other thing that that lent itself to was since I had this one single company, as I started to do things like, uh, you know, create courses that were 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's just me at the end of the day. So, like, if it's a plan scope charge through the plan scope Stripe account or a developer freelancing or what became developer freelancing charge through the other Stripe account, you know, it all went to the same checking account at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So, I had to, you know, one of the things I had to do was go through and uh, go through basically a year's worth of credit card statements and black out everything that wasn't directly plan scope related. Now. This got tricky because sometimes, like with Help Scout, it would be, you know, I'd have the Plan Scope uh, user, I guess, on that, right? But I'd also have one for the other stuff. And it's like, well, do I treat half of that expense as Plan Scope, right? So it became, it, it, it got tricky. And now I'm just, I know sometimes it doesn't make as much financial sense, but now my default is like, if this is potentially a separate saleable asset, I don't care if I could potentially you know, group it under the same billing account as the one I'm using here, I'm going to have two separate accounts. Yep. It's just cleaner. It's easier. A lot of these companies, if you write into support and say, can you move like this inbox from, you know, Help Scout into uh, this other or HubSpot? I always forget the name. Anyway, um, yeah. can you move like this one thing, this one like sub account to a new billing account? Sometimes they can't do that. And then you're running into like responses like, well, we have an API, have fun. Yeah. Um, and it just gets, it gets hairy. So yeah, it's, it's a mess and it's not even necessarily about selling the company, although it will be exponentially easier if everything is nicely organized into its own buckets. To me, it just makes it easier to run the business day to day, handle your own books. And, it, you know, for that matter, see like, Oh wow, this, the, this work I'm doing here is profitable. Once you start charging it against its own expenses and looking at it as its own bucket, you know, you can start to have better insights into what's working, what's successful, and then say, I need to spend less time there, more time here, um, yeah. what have you. And it just, it makes everything clearer, um, even though it's yeah. a little more of a pain to set up different checking accounts, different credit cards, different, like you said, separate accounts on the same product and things like that can get hairy. I think it's worth it in the long run for sure. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Especially, and, well, and in your case too, it's kind of organic, right? It's not like, W freelancing was originally that separate from plan scope. Yeah. And so yeah. it's kind of hard to see that as it happens, right? Cause you're down in it. Correct. Yeah. And, I mean, in retrospect, it's like, yeah, I should have had a clear, I should have known that this content thing would have been not legion for plan scope, but instead a separate business to itself, but I didn't. And, you know, in retrospect, yeah, uh, I think it's different now with right message because we, we did raise some funding from friends. We did do the proper like co-founder thing. So it's like a little more we had to like yeah. if it was just me doing right message, even though I I, uh, I probably knowing myself would have kept it under the same umbrella company, but would have opened up separate accounts. Though. Yeah, because again, I treat I, I'd assume it's an asset sell. But then I would do I, I think Rob Walling did this with Drip where he had like the Numa Group LLC, which was his little umbrella company. And then when he partnered up with Derek and they started to actually do well, he was like, okay, I mean, he did an episode on his podcast about this, but he had to go through and like basically do like IP reassignment for every little thing that seemed like insignificant at the time. Mm -hmm. But just to make it so now, like there's a clear cut between his umbrella company and Trip Incorporated, which, you know, had to happen in legal bills and all that fun stuff. But yeah, totally. Um, so let's switch over and talk a little bit about plateaus. So you've grown multiple Mm -hmm. products now. Um, inevitably they probably each had their own plateaus here and there. Um, were there any that in plateaus and growth revenue customers, were there any plateaus that in hindsight stick out, um, in terms of either how long they dragged on and you started to wonder, is this going to get growing again? And, or what was your solution for, you know, adjusting the dials to break through the plateaus and kind of get back on track and feel good about where growth was going. Yeah. So I can talk about, um, I can give you a few examples. One of them is more recent with the right message. We kind of are escaping from a very minor plateau at the time, mm-hmm. you know, for now, but I'll get to that kind of later. Um, but I mean, with, with plan scope, there were, there was a, really a perpetual plateau in the sense that I was, I was not, putting myself the way I think I had to in the shoes of a buyer. And and what I mean by that is that one of the issues that I had was an adoption issue. 
And I don't, you might have had the same issue with, with Sifter too, where a bit it, it's more than just saying I'm signing up for a you know thirty dollar a month service. Instead, it's saying I'm needing to approach my team and say, hey, we're going to try. It's a crapshoot. We're going to try this new thing. Um, there's the mental friction of, well, is what I'm doing now really that painful that I that I should actually consider switching? And this was a big kind of challenge that I think I know I, I faced with PlanScope. And there'd be a disconnect between when people would find the product, like find the marketing site, and then be ready to actually use it because they're midway through a project and they're not going to, no one's going to switch project management tools midway through a project. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of that kind of friction, right? And I don't think with, with PlanScope, it's a mixture of not knowing enough at the time, but also I think the nature of the beast uh, that I, we, we never really, we never had that like constant up and to the right. It kind of went up to, you know, mid five, 6,000 ish a month and then just kind of sat there. Um, and granted, I mean, a lot of that could have been mitigated had I focused on it more. I was splitting my time between the thing that actually paid the bills, namely selling courses and uh, PlanScope. But there was that, that plateau. And I think a lot of it had to do with that kind of adoption issue. And that's why, you know, when I was looking at right message, I was thinking what I really like about this, which I didn't have with PlanScope, but I don't, I don't think people think about this all the time is that, it doesn't require forming a habit for it to be successful, meaning to use PlanScope or Sifter probably, uh, same thing, uh, successfully, you need to make it a habit. You need to be in it daily and using it daily and so on. Whereas what I really like about right message, which is something I love, like bare metrics, you go, you sign up, um, maybe there's some set, I mean, there's definitely set up work with right message, bare metrics is like a one click go. Mm -hmm. And then you just, I mean, you don't need a, if it's working on your behalf, which is what I like about this marketing tech stuff, if it's continuously working on your behalf on autopilot, once you get it set up, like they're going to keep paying the bills if they're getting that constant ROI. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something that wouldn't require forming a habit to make it uh, successful. So that was one thing, I guess that was one thing I learned from that plateau with PlanScope. But then with W Freelancing, the plateau was always it wasn't as much as of a plateau. It was always fun optimizations. And mm -hmm. I really liked, I like DYF because it's a very formulaic business. I know I get this much traffic a day from Google. This many of them will turn into subscribers. This many of them will make it to the end of the onboarding kind of funnel that leads to a pitch. And then this percentage then will buy. And then if they buy at this point, that means within, you know, 21 days of them becoming a lead, I capture this much revenue and then their lifetime value is X, which means a percentage of them will then move on and buy other stuff. And it's just super predictable. Um, and I think it's because, you know, one thing is it's all transactional. I've dabbled with recurring or installment things with W freelancing, but with little success, um, it's pretty much all transactional. It's you pay this, you get a course and, and that's it. Um, but then there's a lot of things behind the scenes that get people to the point of paying, but also get people to then upset, be upsold on other products, or I should say cross sold on other products that we offer. Um, and that's been the plateaus that there have always been. I mean, the plateau I'm at now is more traffic because I haven't been focusing a lot on SEO. I haven't been focusing a lot on content creation, but the back end funnels are really dialed in. So the thinking is, well, if I'm getting you know, a thousand people a day coming from Google now, and this translates to X in revenue. Well, it, all things being equal, if I got that to 2000 a day, would that effectively double the revenue from this company? Maybe, I don't know. Um, and that's the, those are the fun things, right? When you see, when you can get, put a value on a, uh, on a unique visitor to your website mm -hmm. and you, you can put that value by reverse engineering it from total revenue, right? So you just, how many, how much money do you make? Okay. Divide that by how many customers you made, divide that by how many leads you have that, turn into customers, divide that by how many prospects or visitors you have to your website. You can kind of have a nice little formula um, or not formula, but but like a, an assignment of monetary value for every stage of the funnel. And then it just becomes a matter of saying like, you know, a lead is worth, uh, you know, $20, but a customer is worth 200. How do we make a lead? You know, if, if we can make more leads turn into customers, now every lead is worth $25, which means every visitor is now worth much more too. And it, it, that's, that's been, we haven't really plateaued with UIF. It's been more about like, there's always a list of like 
optimizations I could do to the funnel. And that's really where a lot of the personalization come, came from because I was thinking, well, what if instead of showing the normal call to action, if I thought they were a web designer because they got referred to us from a web design blog that sends a lot of traffic, what if I make the, what if I just throw like web designer colon or designer colon, learn how to you know increase your prices as the call to action for those people. And then I saw like a almost a three X improve in opt-ins and I'm like, okay, that's a very nice way of <laughs> getting, getting to like that stage of the funnel to be multiplied. Right. Um, so in terms of plateaus, I don't really think I had, there were business plateaus in terms of like, do we go for the community like subscription model? We did a thing called the Academy, which was super popular, but we lost money with it. Um, and, and there were a lot of like, I think the plateaus were more about trying to push the edge and thinking, well, we're doing really well with just transactional one-off self-study courses. What if we made this a group live course? Or what if we did this? Or what if we did that? What if we did conferences? Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that has consistently worked for us has been the super low touch. Google traffic comes in, they opt into a lead magnet, that lead magnet then ultimately pitches them on a course. They buy the course during an urgent urgency window. If they have any issues, they write into my VA. And that's the model. And then I just scale kind of horizontally with saying, well, this course is about pricing. Here's one on uh, getting clients. Here's one on project management. Here's one on uh, proposals. And just kind of being able to say, well, then somebody comes in this channel, buys this course, then we can say, well, if you're a freelancer, if you need help with pricing, you probably also need help with sales and marketing. You might even need help with this. So you, there's a lot of really good potential for automating cross-selling there too. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the, the biggest plateaus there were always just trying to experiment too heavily with different models. Um, but yeah, and the other plateau would be the one we had with the right message currently, which was we were, I was super happy we were getting like 30, 40% month over month growth since we launched last January, which I know, I mean, by 30, 40%, that's like 3,000 more MRR a month, but that's still, we're happy about that. Mm -hmm. But then over the last month, it basically plateaued. And the reason for that was we, the way we grew early on was doing demos and, you know, screen shares and Zoom stuff and everything else. And then we said, well, this isn't scalable. This isn't, I mean, it, it is scalable. And we were thinking, you know, we kind of got that normal thing of like, we want the website to sell on its own. We yeah. want really strong inbound channels like I have with Double Freelancing. I don't need it talk to anyone on the phone to sell them a $300 course. Maybe you should have optimized it using a tool like Right Message. I should have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we have. So no, one of the I'm things sure. we have done, well, one of the things that fixed it, because we're out of that plateau, is we have more of a dynamic homepage that, depending on where you are in your awareness funnel, um, we're, we're still <clears> booking, <throat> like, we still are optimizing for the high-touch stuff because that's what's working. Uh, because they think it's such a new tech and all this stuff that people really need to see, like, how could this actually help me in my unique business? But if they've done that already, then the homepage becomes more about getting them to buy. So, you know, we, we, we are using it for kind of w what level of awareness there. Um, but we're still finding and until we until there's more, frankly, competition and more, mm -hmm. you know, more people know implicitly like you know no one needs to be sold on like does email marketing work companies yeah. know it does but um we're kind of at like i think email marketing circa mid 2000s right now with with this stuff where it's like does will this stuff actually work if so what do you do what are the best practices mm -hmm. um and that's why we're really optimizing now for getting case studies in because we you know I, i've been reading a book called crossing the chasm which is all about like going from if you're in a kind of new market from innovators and early adopters to yeah. mainstream appeal. And um, it's all about social proof and seeking in the wild. So we're doing all right. these things like uh, write ask and all these tools that put our branding and make it more turnkey than uh, the way we started. So yeah, I mean, the whole, it's always just a bunch of like putting your ear to the ground, seeing what's working, what isn't. And if it's not working, instead of saying, this sucks, this won't work try to see like, um, can I tr try to figure out exactly why it's not working and make some, you know, hypotheses about what I could do differently and then do it differently and see if it works. And it's just a bunch of like, it's, it sends. I think that, uh, yeah, there's so much to pull out from all this. I think on one hand, as most of us get into this, I say most many, um, we're products people, 
When we hit a plateau, the default assumption is not, I need to fix my marketing or my funnel or whatever. I think some we get there. It's, if only I had this feature. Or after right. I launched right. this feature, it's going to take off. Um, yeah. And I have yet to talk to somebody where that's the case. I've talked to plenty of people where adding a feature enabled them to change their messaging or helped them see something and identify an opportunity. But the feature itself was never it right? It may have been a stepping stone, but it was almost always marketing, adjusting messaging and for changing how you sell in a, you know, instead of expecting the website to do the work, doing a lot more hands on, um, you know, or changing who the audience you're targeting, that kind of thing. Those were the things that moved the needle and got through plateaus, not some random feature launch. Um, and, that was definitely and it's a lot easier. I mean, it's a lot easier to change your marketing site but than it is as to As a do. developer designer, <laughs> that's not the work most people want to do. And yeah, so it's, it's this, exactly. there's this mental block and this hurdle. And uh, I think one of the other things, uh, kind of t almost two parts, and this is back in the beginning with PlanScope because I related to it so much. One is I think we all underestimate the amount of social capital that anybody puts on the line to try and convince a team to switch collaboration software. Oh, yeah. Right? Yes. So um, – whether it's a bug tracker, a project management tool, what have you, I might try it, say like Trello or something by myself. I'm using it and for my own task management and I love it. And it's like, hey, we should use this for the team. It takes a lot of usage for an individual to, and it, it's subconscious. Nobody's thinking I'm going to spend some social capital and try and sell my team today. But that's what's happening in the background. So I'm not going to present this to my team until I'm 100% confident it works for me or that it will solve the problems we have. Um, and there's that dynamic is a really hard thing to help people get through. And I think that's where, for me, the, the biggest plateau and the, the most interesting breakthrough I had was with the onboarding, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't change a feature. I just spent some time fixing onboarding. The product had evolved. The onboarding never really evolved with it. And I changed the onboarding in such a way that it um, made it lower pressure to invite teammates and to kind of poke around like very like low commitment. And that made a huge, huge difference just by adjusting onboarding in a way that took into account the fact that a team doesn't just all six people sit down one day and go, Hey guys, let's sign up for Sifter, right? It's yeah. one person signs up, pokes around. And so they need yep. to invite somebody else to just poke around. And then after the course of a month, maybe something else they're like, Hey, remember that time we should go try that out. It looked like it was promising. And then that's the yeah. sales cycle. And it's so easy to overlook that. But with collaboration software, once you get the whole team on board, you're in, you're in a good spot as far as churn and all that goes. But you have to understand that you're winning over a team, not just slapping up a marketing site and everybody's just going to sign up, you know, sit down and have a, a sifter sign up party. Like that's never going to happen. <laughs> you know, for, for with PlanScope, my, um, who they had to sell was their client. Right. So yeah, I, I focused a lot, like I think a lot of us do on onboarding the person who signs up. Right. So that first yep. user and then they have blank data. So we have like empty state stuff and all this good stuff. And then they would, so what would typically happen is they would load in like a project and a bunch of tasks, so on, invite a client, client gets in, dumped in head first, mm -hmm. no onboarding and an account full of data. And they would like what ended up happening would be a lot of them would be I mean, the ones that stuck were the ones where the freelancer would sit physically next to their client and sign them up in person. Right. And then walk them through it in person and basically yeah. onboarded them for us. And it wasn't until oh, I mean, the changes. Did you hear that on your end. A now we hear feedback or something going on. I think it died down. I mean, we're in good shape. OK, cool. Um, yeah. And what, and basically like, you know, it wasn't until I started to think of the person that I needed to really sell and convince is the other users to get at it, right. Namely the clients, because if they don't use it, then the whole thing's kind of moot. Right? right. So that's actually, that, that is one of the reasons that I like, I mean, that's, that's a very, like I said, the thing I like about right message is we don't really have that issue anymore. I mean, we have, there's really not a need for not only need just yet, I should say for like no. sub account or sub user or other user onboarding just yet. Um, but it, it will be eventually. But the good thing is for us, 
the success or the, the value of the product is not dependent on collaboration. It's dependent on, you know, collecting results and bubbling them to the surface. So um, that, that's been one nice thing, I think, about the difference between plan, scope, and right message. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that echoes so much of my experience with Sifter um, yeah. in so many ways. So let's talk about acquisition. And um, so with, with right message, obviously y'all have been very hands-on, um, doing demos, helping people get set up, helping people transition. Um, and like you mentioned before, in and of itself, the way you're doing it precisely now is not truly long-term scalable. Um, talk a little bit about the, the trade-offs and the understanding. Cause obviously there's, there's a lot of, you're not just selling your learning as you're talking to people. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so talk a little bit about kind of how you're using that and leveraging that and kind of turning that into a feedback loop to how you then sell and try to automate some of the, the site selling itself. Yeah. So there's two, I think there's two components, right? One of which is the communication of the, the outcome or the offer, right? Which is the marketing site. And that we found the benefit of doing kind of the high touch demos, which the goal of the marketing site really now is just to pique somebody's interest and get them to book a demo. Um, and then at the demo is where we dig into things like, you know, who is this company? How do they make money? What role does their website currently have? And based on what we know and data we've seen from our customers, what are some things they could probably do to make an impact? So it becomes more of a conversation, a discussion, instead of us kind of throwing that all front and center on the marketing site. We tried doing that. It didn't work that well because I, I still think it's we're still trying to figure out exactly how do we do this best. We can do it really well in conversation. We can do it really well by saying, here's your website. Um, you have this type of person going to it and this type of person going to it. What if we change this and this? And now we're getting to the point uh, with rolling out tools like Right Bar and Right Ask that it's much more self-obvious because the difference is earlier on, we were going after personalization, right? So people kind of intuitively get it, but they don't know where to start. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know like a lot of these different things. And now what we're doing is we're going more against like, we're like sumo, but really smart in the sense that like, you already know, like if, if, if you're a marketer, you already know about how effective, you know, um, you know, opt-ins and, and sticky bars and all that kind of stuff are right. Like these different CRO tools. But what if, you can make it so depending on where somebody was in your overall funnel, what you're, pro what you're promoting changes, right? Which a lot of people don't do. A lot of people optimize for anonymous traffic. So that's been much easier to sell than saying, hey, we're like an if this, then that engine for your website, where if this is true, then change that. Yeah. And the big question was always, well, what, what is that? What are, what are we changing, right? So, um, and we've also realized that people have a lot of issues with uh, segmentation. A lot of people don't segment. They don't have, they know if you're a customer or not, but beyond that, a lot of people don't really have any data. So we've built tools like right ask, which let people, uh, do these unobtrusive surveys on their website that not only collect kind of high level data about breakup of audiences, but also let you assign individual responses with the person viewing. So if I go to, you know, um, I don't know if I go to Beanstalk site and a little thing pops up saying, uh, are you more of a, like, what's your job role, right? Mm -hmm. So I click, I'm a marketer or something, or executive, let's say. Um, that allows, you know, you to profile people over time, but then then you know, okay, well, you know, I have half, half executives, half business owners, half more IT developer types. Um, we need to sell to each of these two types of people differently. But, but before we rolled out something like RightAsk, a lot of companies couldn't do that. How would you know if this person's a developer or this person's more kind of management, right? Um, so th that's been helpful. And, and we've been really bringing, using that to help sell it over, you know, these demos that we've been doing. So that's, that's the one component. The other component is once they're in. So we've actually intentionally left off a lot. Of, we don't really have much onboarding to speak of because what we're doing now is we're basically saying, when you sign up, we're going to get on a screen share. We're basically going to consult with you. You're going to drive, but we're going to be there to um, give you ideas on what to do and, and basically do what no software onboarding could ever do, namely 
actually be a, a human being who sees the stuff day in and day out. And it's going to tell you based on your circumstances what you should probably be doing. Now, automated onboarding can get close to that, but this is actually, there's going to be a downgrade in our onboarding once we make it more automated. Um, but right now we're, we're doing it this way, which does have some resistance, but the kind of clients that we want to get, the more of the ones who have real businesses who want real results and aren't just tire kickers, they're very okay with this because this is actually better for them. So the, the one thing about demos that obviously y'all are getting and doing well that I feel like most people miss is people sit out and say, we're going to start doing demos. And they think we need a script and we need to walk through this and do this exact thing. And really with a demo, a demo isn't so much a demo as an interview. You're interviewing the customer and then showing them things in response to their own issues and challenges so that in effect, no demo should ever be the same. Every no. demo should be, they should share similarities, but they should cater completely to whatever pains your potential customers feeling. And I feel like that's something that like, I don't know at what point I realized that and learned that, but it was one of those epiphanies of, you know, don't just walk people through your software, like walk them through their software using, you know, like it treat it as their account and, and really interact with them in that way. Ask them questions. You should barely do any talking, let them do all the talking and you're just answering their questions by showing them things within the software. And I think that's, that's right. so like any kind of onboarding, it's about them again. It's not about your product. It's a, totally about them and their needs and their interests and their challenges. And that, Hey, it makes it so much easier to demo things too. Right. Yeah. Cause you don't yeah. have to do all the talking. You're not going to lose your voice. Um, and so I think that's just a huge, huge, uh, epiphany that I had. Well, I think for me, I mean, it was, you know, the problem I think is the, the name demo demonstration. It's, it's a, here's how it works. Here's, I'm going to walk you through A to B, the pro, you know, A to Z, the product. Yeah. Um, but when you realize it's sales, it's a, yeah. like a, any salesperson worth their salt knows that the more you shut up, the more likely it is to work. Right. Mm -hmm. So the more you can say, well, you know, tell me why, you know, if I, if I'm going to get a car, and I'm just getting a demo of here's this feature, this feature, this feature. I mean, that to be frank, that that's going to work better for somebody like me um, because that's that's what I go for. I go for like what are the features, what are the mm -hmm. technicals. But what good salespeople will do at a car lot will ask you things like, so you know what what's why do you want it? Why do you want this car? It's going to be your like daily driver. It's going to be more of a you know date night car. Um, do you go on a lot of road trips? Like tell me about your family. And they're going to ask you questions and listen to you. And I mean, really, I think good sales is aligning. This is a need with this is a, an offer, right? It's just the alignment of the two. And a good salesperson, their whole job is kind of a matchmaker between need and offer. So, you know, I mean, that's why I really respect companies that say like, I mean, I, I was talking, I'm looking at car stuff now and talked to somebody yesterday who was like, we're not going to be a good fit. And here's why. Here's what I would do differently and so on. And yeah, I mean, they, it didn't align well with them. Right. So that's, that's, I think the kind of stuff that I think if you look at your demos as you saying, I've got a tool, people don't want a tool. They want an outcome. How can I translate the need that I'm hearing? The, the, the thing that somebody needs from us, the, 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 you know, this is where they're right now. They want to get over here. They think that our tool can help them maybe get from A to B. Now it's my job to show them what route they would take using our tool to get there. And that, that's it, right? So, you know, you, you start with where do they need to be, where are they right now, and how do we use, using our software, how can they get, you know, go from here to there? And it's the same thing you do, whether you're selling consulting, whether you're selling, you know, software or whatever, it's the same formula. Um, but I think, like you said, I think a lot of us just wanna, we think of it as a, I'm gonna walk you through the product, but, you know, that's, not necessarily what need, I mean, that should happen to a degree, but it's not what people yeah. really want. They want to know how can this get me to where I need to be? And that's where the whole like benefit focused marketing site stuff comes up where, you know, I mean, there's a, I think there's a balance between this, this I think has to do with knowing your audience. If you have technical people buying from you, you can't just be super high level abstract because that's not going to potentially help them. 
But if you've got executives buying from you who are non-technical, you, you need to speak to them differently. And it's just, again, knowing your audience. And I think the best way is having a lot of discussions, conversations, and then codifying it into a monologue, codifying it into sales copy as a result of conversations, not as a preemptive way of, right? So yeah. let, the, let the monologue emerge from the dialogue, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, totally. So we've got two kind of closing questions that uh, they're similar, but it's kind of, I feel like it's been the best way to wrap up. So the first is through all of this, um, any of the products really, what's been the, like the single most difficult day or week and experience that you've gone through where you were like, Oh crap. And just completely deflated you. And then how'd you recover from it? Uh, first time I had to fire somebody, I think. So that was more recent with the right message. Um, it's one of those things where it just wasn't working out. I think we both knew it, but I, um, it's always hard. Right. So I think that's kind of the, 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 kind of this weird idealist that in a perfect world, everyone just gets along, everyone does their job, everyone just, we're just all kicking butt. Um, but I'm, I'm with every, every business that, that comes, I'm, I'm realizing more and more that it's much more than just the thing you're selling. It's the, you know, the culture, the atmosphere of the company and so on. And um, you always feel like, you know, this is my fault. This was something I should have done differently to make it so I'm not in this position. Um, so I think that would be it. It's, it's more that kind of like, you know, that was definitely it for me recently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the one thing that, uh, from talking to others about firing people is that a lot of times too, you realize and you avoid it because you really don't want to do it and it's going to be miserable and unpleasant. Um, but if you do it right and with empathy, the truth is it's better for both parties, yeah. right? Like, it's, they're not in a great, great place. There's probably a better role for them somewhere else. Um, but the key is to just do it with empathy and understand that, yes, it's going to be crummy, but it's not necessarily crummy. You know, it's not about how it's going to be crummy for you as an employer, but how do you help them find that, find their footing to get that next role, whatever it is. And that, that can kind of change the, the dialogue and the conversation and thinking about, how do we help you get in a better place that just happens to not be here for whatever yeah. reason? Yeah. Um, yep. And so the next one is really simple. If you could go back seven years, whatever, and give yourself one piece of advice and know that even though it's a younger you, you're actually going to follow the advice. What would that advice be? Don't start with SAS. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> I, I think I can read between the lines there, but can you expand on that? Yeah, I would, um, I would look at, so I think the thing, again, as a software developer, I had a undue attachment to software. At the end of the day, if you start to think like what people really want are just a better outcome, um, there are easier ways of delivering that outcome in, in different ways, right? Like if you think about it on the spectrum, on the one end you have consulting, which is, I have the knowledge and I have the experience to do it all myself and to guide you in the right way. And, you know, you pay me a lot more, but it's all done for you. On the other extreme, you have information. It's I will teach you how to do this based on what I know. And, um, you know, but it's much easier to uh, to develop typically. But it's up to the buyer, the customer to implement. And then in the middle, you have kind of like software, which is kind of turnkey ish and that it, it's kind of this hybrid approach. And, um, but it tends to be very hard to get off the ground. So I think like if all things being equal, if you could say like, you know, in my case, people want to use personalization to, to increase sales, which is what people are attracted to. Mm -hmm. It's much easier for me to teach doing that. Maybe ideally originally in like a workshop or, you know, one-on-one -on -one consulting and get an idea of like, what are the objections people have? What are the, what kind of pain points really are people saying in their own words? And test this out through other forms of achieving that same, out, same outcome versus going head first and saying, I'm going to break ground on a new app, do this, build a marketing site, figure out like how we get people to the market. Like it's just, it's much easier to start from those other uh, channels and then go into software later on. Yeah. Like the, the best approach to starting a SaaS app would be to have say like a two year plan where you start out 
the first six months, you're just pure straight blogging, building an audience, trying to, you know, promoting the content. Then you start transitioning that into some info products and then maybe like just more productized consulting where you're selling and learning. And then you've hopefully built up a little bit of a revenue stream to help offset and help, you know, bridge a gap between maybe quitting a job and starting it and, or getting ramping up your SaaS revenue. And then you take all that knowledge, you apply it to the SaaS app and you're going to be infinitely better off because you yeah. front loaded all of the learning in a much more low risk environment. Heck, I mean, it could be that once you do get to the info product, you could find, man, I, there's not an app here. There's, I thought it was a great idea, but it's not. And so you validated it, hopefully made a little bit of money it through the process of validation and then realized it before you went headfirst into a SaaS app, which has ideally it scales really well revenue wise, but you're definitely front loading a lot of costs in terms of server setup, building the app, all that kind of stuff. So it feels like a way, to, a great way to de-risk it, both learning-wise and financially, to help kind of be a stepping stone instead of just diving in head first. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Right on. Uh, this was awesome and incredibly dense. I think in terms of <laughs> covering ground. Uh, thanks so much for being on, and uh, I'll keep you posted when we get this published. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Garrett. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm.